Welcome to Simplify. I'm Caitlin Schiller. And I'm Ben Schumann Solar. Hi, Ben. Hello. You are so excited for this episode. <laughs> I am. This episode is with Ken Page. Ken Page is a psychotherapist and he's an expert on the search for intimacy. Um, he's the author of a book called Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. The word seduction always makes me laugh, but he is also host of the Deeper Dating podcast and he's co-founder of DeeperDating.com. Yeah, I would recommend if someone doesn't know Ken Page's work to Google Ken Page Psychology Today. Mm, yes. And he's written a bunch of articles. I mean, my introduction was articles that you'd sent me from him. Mm -hmm. And it's they're like concise and they're just mind blowing. So, yeah. so why did you want to have him on the show? Uh, I wanted to have him on the show because I have found as a once again, single person, Rock. Um, I decided that I, I wanted to, you know, learn more about dating really and like what it's good for. So I was looking for some different materials and I discovered Ken through his podcast and then I read his book and I've just found the way that he has of articulating some certain things that I think we all kind of feel familiar with to be so clear and helpful. Um, but also he's got a couple concepts that I think are really kind of original and helpful. And I think that for anybody who wants to achieve greater intimacy in their current relationships or with themselves, actually, um, I'd really, really recommend checking out Ken's work. So you, you mentioned these uh, cool concepts. What's one of them that people should really look out for in the interview? Um, I think that one of the, like, the foundational aspect of Ken's work is this idea of core gifts, which sounds a little touchy-feely, but the idea of we all have these core gifts and they are the things that we are most embarrassed of, the things that give us the most shame, the things that people in our lives, maybe when we were younger, have told us were not acceptable, but they're actually these really intense foundational aspects of our being that once we learn what they are and learn how to appreciate them the right way, we can share with other people and be really authentic, true versions of ourselves in any kind of relationship. All right. So with that in mind, let's play the interview. And then we have a bunch of good books in the bookend this time. Yeah. I mean, as always, really, but you know, and let's roll the tape. Let's do it. All right, Ken, as I like to say, could you please introduce yourself the way that you like to be introduced? Absolutely. So I'm Ken Page and I am a psychotherapist and I'm the author of the book, Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. Uh, my personal story is that I am someone who looked for a relationship really, really hard and hit against a wall of profound lack of success again and again for decades. And I had to become a student of what I was not doing right, a student of what I needed to learn, which I think we all do. Mm. And the book and everything I do kind of springs from really a place of a humble awareness of my clay feet when it comes to intimacy. <laughs> and it's from that place that I've learned things that have changed my life and have changed the lives of a lot of other people. Because it turned out that my walls against love were made of me. <sighs> and so that I was going to be able to soften them and take them apart and disassemble them once I knew what they were, because they were just kind of contorted versions of me built to protect me. What a huge insight that is to learn that our walls are made of the same material as our hearts. Oh. And so that discovery, yeah, that discovery has been at the heart of my journey and what I teach. Oh, that was so poetic. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. There actually there there are many moments in your book. You have a way of finding these um these really nice metaphors that have helped me really gain greater insight. And so much of what you offer is just so practical and useful. It takes some risk, but it's so useful. And I think that the best thing we could do is maybe focus on what I think are the three most 
unique aspects of your work, really concepts I hadn't heard anywhere else and have really changed the way that I've been living my life and thinking about how I want to conduct my romantic life in the future. And those three pillars are gift theory, because that's where it all starts, Uh, attractions of inspiration and attractions of deprivation, because we've all got those and we'll keep running ourselves up against the walls and over cliffs until we understand the difference between them. Mm. And the ways in which we avoid real love or fear of intimacy. I love that formulation and let's do it. Amazing. Let's kick it off with gift theory. Um, We've all we've all got gifts. We know that. But how does this relate to dating and intimacy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hugely important and it is counterintuitive. So when you normally think of gifts, you think of a strength, a quality that is kind of just positive, like gifts as opposed to wounds or weaknesses. Mm. But in fact, that is not an adequate understanding of what it means to be human. We in fact live in a swirl that I call the gift wound matrix. And the key piece about that is people often say, well, my gifts come out of my wounds because they made me stronger. But I think that our wounds come out of our gifts. And our gifts are the places we feel the most deeply. And they are parts of ourselves that the world often doesn't understand or steps on. And we don't understand because they are portals to a much greater self. They don't fit. Our gifts don't fit inside our being. It's like we're just too sensitive or we're too fierce and too passionate. There's so many different ways. Uh, Usually, it would fit into two categories. It would either fit into a category of gifts of deep sensitivity or gifts of intensity. Mm -hmm. And for all of us, it's a mixture of both. And our gifts are the places we feel we don't fit into the world because of our differentness. But those gifts are vast and important parts of ourselves. Like some people have called core gifts like shards of God inside us. They're too big to fit. They're vast. They're portals to bigger spaces. And we find them in the heart of our deepest insecurities. And all of us need to learn how to name and excavate and then finally cherish these core gifts. So every place You've told yourself, I'm too sensitive. There's a process to reframe that and think, how is this connected to my deepest gift? What if this was a gift that was so powerful that it was hard to manage? Every place where you feel like you're too much or too intense or you care about things more than other people, what if those were not your weird spots? What if those were not curses? What if those were your most profound gifts? And they are. And they are the parts that will lead you to a relationship that could be wonderful. And it's true. It changes our world when we honor ourselves from the inside out instead of focusing on fixing ourselves Mm. from the outside in. Right. And this to me is a formula that's like the deeper physics of dating. The degree to which we cherish those gifts, not accept them, but live from them and cherish them. To that degree, and this is like kind of almost miraculous, but it's true. To that degree, we are going to find ourselves sexually and romantically attracted to people who treasure us for who we really are. And the converse is true as well. The degree to which we kind of push those things aside and think, well, I'll show them when I meet the right person, or we feel ambivalent, we don't really totally embrace them, or we actually maybe even feel deep shame around them. To that degree, we're going to end up sexually and romantically attracted to people who hurt us and to masochistic situations. Because our core gifts are the center of our very being. And until we treasure them, we will be lost. That's the profound (gasps) essence of this. The parts of you you've been most embarrassed about are your sacred parts. Right. So, man, there's a lot in there. And I think that for people who are not steeped in everything you've been teaching as much as I am, they might be going, okay, this is a mind-blowing idea. But what are some examples of what these unloved gifts that we have to offer that we we haven't 
maybe cherished in ourselves yet. What are some examples that people discover in themselves? So some examples, I'll use myself as an example. So um, one part of me is a deep, deep sensitivity. I remember seeing West Side Story when I was little. I was sitting in the front row and... um, when the really sad part happened, I won't say it for mm. the people that haven't seen West Side Story, but when the really sad part happened, I was like eight. I just, I fell apart. I was just weeping and weeping. And I remember looking down into the orchestra pit and seeing the violinist nudge the violinist next to her and point at me, and they were both oh. laughing. I will never forget how angry I was at that moment. But it was an example kind of of how intensely I felt things, how I was moved to tears and joy so quickly and so profoundly. And I grew up a gay kid in a family of Holocaust survivors who survived by being tough. Mm. So these parts of me were too big to handle. Mm. So I was befuddled and broken, and I felt like the kind of what they call the assigned crazy one, the assigned Uh sick one in the family because of that. Oh, my goodness. That resonates with me very deeply. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. This captures so many people's experience of being too sensitive for the world. So that is one example. Um, mm. And this this leads to how you can all discover, how all the listeners can discover their own core gifts. Okay. And here's how. I'm going to share an exercise. Just take take about two days. Have a journal. Have your phone. And what I'd like you to do is to note two things in those two days, again and again. Note the things that hurt you in your interactions with the world. Note what they are. When you notice that kind of pain, even if it's like kind of a paper cut pain, like you don't notice it at first, it's so little, and then then it stings after the interaction. Notice the pains that you feel, the places that you feel hurt, even mildly hurt in your interactions. And instead of telling yourself you're being too sensitive, instead, I want you to think, okay, this obviously marks a place where I care pretty deeply, or it wouldn't hurt. What is it that I am caring about? Mm. What's the value in this that's being stepped on or hurt? Mm. That will identify a core gift. And if you do that for two days, I could pretty much promise you there'll be two or three different things that come up again and again, because the places we get hurt the most are the places we care the most. The places we care the most are our core gifts. Mm. And the other one is to notice the things that give you joy, that fill your heart. And they could be silly things. They could be strange things. But just noticing the things that just like cause like a kind of a wave of warmth or peace or pleasure or giddiness, notice what they are. And with those, don't just pass over them as nice moments. Think here How might this be a fuel that I need for my own joy in life? How might this be something really important about what fills my heart and inspires me? And after two days of doing that, it'll be like a connect the dots puzzle. A picture will emerge and it'll be a picture of your key core gifts. And when you do that, it's like finally finding the user's manual for your life. Mm Mm-hmm so cool. It's just so helpful and actionable and you don't often get exercises like this. I find that too. And what that speaks to is this core gift concept, which is the bravery. You're with someone in a relationship and you're feeling these things that you kind of judge. And then you shift your focus to think what Well, what is it I'm feeling? And then what might be the gift here? And when you've got that, then you're going to begin to have the language of having intimacy again. But when you don't have it, you will put up what's called a primitive defense, a defense that is not conscious. And it's your psyche, your deep psyche, protecting you because you're not honoring yourself. So the second best alternative is to put up a wall against closeness. And that's, you know, that's the meat and potatoes of the intimacy journey is finding that and then 
finding out what is causing that wall, what's the part of you that's not being seen or listened to. And that brings me to the second point that you raised, which is this concept of attractions of inspiration and deprivation. Ooh, you're good. So should I jump into that? Sure. I can't <laughs> believe you made the segue for me. Nobody ever does that. Please, Ken, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> So this, I'm going to talk about this from my own experience. I remember it was summer vacation. I was hanging out with my closest friend, and I had just completed my meditation in which I had a a kind of very sobering insight. And I, I looked at him and I said, would you say that of all the people you know, I am the person most crippled by a particular romantic type? And that I'm, you know, just completely locked into, but is not good for me. And he looked at me and he said, Ken, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Those moments of honesty from your friends. Oh, yeah. I love to think of friends as life editors, actually. Oh, that's so great. I have to ask you to just say something more about that because I love that. Oh, I I was just thinking, I think of of my close friends as my board of editors, my board of directors are my editors, because you're willing to show them the raw material and let them get in there and help you shape it. Ask them questions, show them what's really on your mind. And if you just give them an in and a pen in their hand, they're more than willing to tell you, yeah, this sentence needs some work or yeah, this whole section, this is not doing you any good. Let's find ways to remove it together. (laughs) That is amazing. I love that. I have never heard that before. (sighs) <sighs> so your friend gave you this insight and he said, yes, Ken, you are crippled by this attraction to a certain type. Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah. So that was the beginning of a very sobering realization, because if you have a type that you're attracted to that is not so great for you, it matches just like a mold matches the shape of the object that it creates. It matches parts of you that you have never learned to honor fully. Mm -hmm. As you learn to honor those parts, your attractions will actually begin to change. And our sexual and romantic attractions are actually more plastic than we've been taught. And they directly shift with the work that we do on ourselves. So anyway, having shame around my sensitivity, I was continuously attracted to guys who lacked a lot of empathy which matched my shame around my softness precisely. Mm. And that was what was sexy to me. So then, you know, that's a dilemma, right? Like, what am I going to have to relegate myself to a life where I'm with someone I'm not attracted to just because they're a good person? Mm. It's a horrible spot to be in. But in fact, when we do the work of treasuring and dignifying our core gifts, we develop a different kind of like sense of a spine, When we don't honor the soft part of who we are inside, we need armor. When we have a spine, which is that state of honoring and dignifying our core gifts, we don't need that armor anymore as much. So I began that journey thanks to a wonderful, wonderful therapist. And my attractions began to change. And all of a sudden, I thought, wait a minute. Maybe I actually screwed up me. Maybe I actually have another circuitry that can be attracted to people for a different set of reasons. And I realized that, in fact, in a very binary, oversimplistic way, all of us have two circuitries of attraction that lead us in completely different directions. We can be attracted to what I call attractions of deprivation, where somebody almost loves us almost can commit, almost sees us, almost treats us right. And then we get hooked in this ancient place where we try to get them to love us right. That Mm. links into the ways that we feel we're not enough. And it feels like love. It feels like white, hot love and desire. And it's the path to pain. That is an attraction of deprivation. A lot of us, without knowing this difference, spend a lot of time pursuing those relationships. But there's another circuitry of attraction, which is what I call attractions of inspiration, where we're attracted to someone because of their profound goodness, their decency, their care, qualities that truly inspire our heart. And when you find an attraction of inspiration, when you make it a conscious choice that you are only, only going to pursue those circuitries of attraction, it changes everything. And when you find 
a relationship where someone's goodness and decency and integrity is just wonderful and you're attracted to them and they care about you too. It's just the most amazingly wonderful feeling. It's a combination of peace and thrill somehow mixed together. It's just a heart-bursting goodness. Mm. So we all can make that choice. We all can. But then why, if that second thing you described, this this combination of peace and thrill sounds beautiful and ideal, why don't we just go for that kind, Ken? Well, I think two things happen. One, they might not seem as white hot from the beginning. Mm. Harville Hendricks, who is just one of my heroes, says that if you imagine a spectrum of attraction from zero to ten, the people who are like the nines and the tens, like they just like you almost feel sick inside. You're so desirous of them. Those people are so because consciously they embody some of the characteristics that you think are the most wonderful. Mm. But unconsciously, your psyche knows that they are capable of hurting you in just the places you are most deeply hurt by your primary caregivers and by the world. And your ego wants to go back to the scene of the crime to finally fix it and be loved right, which is not a recipe for success. <laughs> but that's why these relationships seems so exciting. And that's why we often gravitate toward them first. I mean, probably, Caitlin, you know people who, you know, from early on made choices, romantic choices based on attractions of inspiration. And those are the people that find healthy relationships more easily. For the rest of us, we have to retrain ourselves. Mm Mm-hmm. This is just a quick break from my talk with the wonderful Ken Page to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that gives you a sneak peek into a whole world of great nonfiction books, including Ken's, by identifying the key ideas and transforming them into powerful little capsules of text or audio that you can digest in just 15 to 20 minutes. And now they're also shortcasts. A shortcast does exactly what Blinkist does for books, except for podcasts and in concert with the original hosts. If you like this episode with Ken, then you will probably love the Bag of Dreamclaim shortcast. It is with Natalie Liu, and she talks about a lot of similar topics to Ken. I think that they're akin in that way. So as with most things, it is better if you just try it out yourself. So go to Blinkist.com slash simplify, click try Blinkist in the top right hand corner, and you can try it for 14 days for free by entering the code core. Or gifts. That's C-O-R-E-G-I-F-T-S, no spaces. Go ahead and enter that in Blinkist.com slash simplify and you get 14 days free to play with shortcasts and all of our wonderful key insight summaries. Okay, now back to my talk with Ken. So then how do I know that someone might be an attraction of inspiration and not just boring? <laughs> Because some of the ways in which you framed attractions of inspiration makes it seem like they might feel a little bit dull to me. How can I, when I'm meeting new people, how do I know that this is an attraction of inspiration? Yeah, yes, yeah, such an important point. You know, and I will say that the two people who became my closest friends in life, in the beginning, I wondered if they were boring, but they weren't boring and they were really smart. But the excitement came not because they took me on a roller coaster ride of pain and joy. That's exciting, but that's useless. Mm. But because that was lacking, because there was a steadiness of their decency and presentness, I, given my history, interpreted that as boring. Now, if these people were boring, I wouldn't have stayed with them because I can't tolerate boring. But I found out that that was, in fact, not the case. Mm. Um, But this brings up the point of what I think is the greatest single saboteur of healthy love that exists. And it's what I call the wave or the wave of distancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please tell me about that. 
So, so this wave of distancing, I believe, is what kept me single for decades and decades. And I just can't believe that no one had a name for this that they could tell me about. I mean, the closest thing was that Groucho Marx concept of that I wouldn't want to be a member of any country club that would have me as, as a member. Oh, yeah. And I remember hearing that. It was like being stabbed by truth. Oh, like, man. Oh, oh, oh. But, but what I didn't know is that this is a thing, this wave of distancing. And when I speak to a crowd of people, pretty much always between half and two thirds of the crowd, when I ask them if they suffer with this, will raise their hands, yes. And so here's what it is. It is when you meet somebody and there's some attraction, you're attracted to them. And then over a little bit of time, you find that they're not going anywhere. They're interested. They're present. Mm. And that there is not that spice of them coming and going, treating you well, not treating you well, making you feel like you're not enough and you have to earn their appreciation. They're just steady. Now, they could be fierce and smart and capable and um, sexy and wonderful in all these different ways, but that particular spice of unavailability and feeling like you have to prove yourself isn't there. And so all of a sudden, they start seeming less desirable. And you want to go back to the thrill of the hunt. Or mm. all of a sudden, like you notice that their ears are just like, how did you not notice this before? Their <sighs> ears are just like so unattractive. Or I hate that laugh. I never <laughs> noticed it before. But these things come up that, you know, make you feel kind of repulsed or distanced or bored. And then you feel like two things. One thing is, all right, I better get out of here because this isn't fair to them because yeah. I'm obviously not interested enough. And it's going to feel horrible to me if I get any more entrenched and then have to pull away. So you want to leave for that reason. Mm. And then the other thing that you feel is, oh, my God, am I screwed up? Am I immature when it comes to intimacy? Like, oh, but I am. And I have to look for someone I'm more attracted to. Mm. And that is what happened to me, along with the attendant sense of sadness and emptiness for decades, from when I was like 20 years old mm. until I was um, a lot older, <laughs> a lot older, <laughs> in my 40s. Yeah. Um, and I felt helpless around this, and I didn't understand that it was a thing. And here is the thing that it is. It is a wave of fear. It is a spasm of fear, just like a mother bird that if you get close to its babies, it'll attack you mm -hmm. or it'll play dead on the floor. It's your psyche knowing this is someone who could, you know, it's not conscious, but this is someone who could really, really pull the rug out from under you. Yeah. Because if someone like this lets you go, then you have nothing. And so we protect ourselves by getting afraid or highly judgmental or some kind of combination thereof. And what I didn't realize is that it's a wave. And what do I mean by it's a wave? It hits you. It slams into you, it knocks you over, and then it goes away. And I never stayed long enough for it to go away because no one ever told me two things. One, don't flee. Don't flee when you feel the wave. Stay. And the other thing is back up a little bit because you're terrified. You just mm -hmm. don't know it. And you need air and room and space. That is the great medicine at that juncture. So if you feel not ready to have sex, even though you've had sex already before, or you don't feel ready for that weekend away, shift backwards Give yourself space. You might want to like go for a walk with them and their dog because you love the way they are with their dog. And allow yourself to kind of almost fetishize the qualities that you like about them. Let yourself enjoy them. Take pleasure in them. Have sexual fantasies about the parts of them that at that moment you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do that, if you don't pressure yourself, you give yourself room to breathe and you don't flee, really something amazing will happen almost always. The wave will pass and when it passes, your feelings are going to come back again. And when they come back, you will also have a better sense of if this person is right for you or not. Mm. Nobody teaches us this. Nobody teaches us this. That's so true. Thank you for sharing that. I find that so useful. It's one of the, probably the most 
oh, you can see it in, in people you were dating too. I've seen it in people that I dated when this wave comes in and uh, yeah. that can be really destructive. And it's, I've seen it in myself as well. And it was really comforting to hear it articulated this way. Um, another thing, one of the, the most useful, kind things in, in your book was this idea that everybody has a fear of intimacy. It's not just like all your bad exes had a fear of intimacy. Every single right. person on this earth, because intimacy is so important. So, of course, it scares the crap out of us. And there are myriad ways that we flee intimacy that we're not accustomed to thinking of as ways we flee intimacy. Would you mind naming a few of those? So, some of the ways that we flee intimacy without even realizing it are, one, choosing people who are not that available. And losing days and months and years trying to get them to love us right. That's a huge one. Another one is not showing who we are. Showing some kind of airbrushed, protected version of who we are Mm -hmm. and hiding our real self, which also wastes a huge amount of time, attracts the wrong people. And this this is a really intense thing. People sense lack of self-honoring, and they prey upon it if there are people who are built to prey upon it. So when you're someone who doesn't show who you really are, who tries to people-please by being something other than who you are, you will attract people who sense that weakness and want to take advantage of it. Mm. Another way that we flee intimacy is disconnecting from our feelings. All the ways that we flee the awkwardness of moment-to-moment authenticity by running to something else, work or our phones or whatever it is, those are ways that we flee the heat of intimacy. And then I'll just say one more, which is a huge one. Not being able to name or articulate our deeper needs because we're just so embarrassed by them. Our sexual needs our romantic needs, our emotional needs. They just feel so quirky that we say, I I can't really say that. But the act of saying them will help you discover who are your people. Because when you say things like that to the people who are right for you, who are attractions of inspiration, they'll listen. And Mm. when you say it to people who aren't, they'll gaslight you, they'll judge you, they'll criticize you. So that's a really important thing is the articulation of your needs. That is what melts our walls in a very interactive way. Because ultimately, in any healthy, intimate relationship, you will experience ways. Harville Hendricks, again, says it so brilliantly. He says, you reach a point in a relationship that the things you most need are the things your partner is least able to give you. And that's not the end of the relationship. That's the beginning of intimacy. Because you both have to create a shared language and a shared bridge. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Mm. Oh, Ken, the, I, I could talk to you for the rest of the day, but I want to ask you two things. And I'll, I'll start with the more difficult one. What's one thing that you would tell someone who's feeling really, really worried about their prospects now? What could they change to make the journey toward finding good love easier? It is not as much a numbers game as we have been led to believe. I know that for a fact. In writing Deeper Dating, I researched a lot of couples and I found relationships where people who were paraplegic and and felt like that's it. You know, they had an accident, they became paraplegic, and they felt like I will never have anything. And they, they found wonderful lifelong relationships. Mm-hmm. People who were in their 90s who found them. People who moved away to some weird, strange place, away from the urban centers where they thought they would find love, you know, for decades and decades and didn't, and then found love. There's a deeper story here, and it's not the story we think. And when we follow these stages, these processes of self-honoring, self-expression, and mix those in with bravery and a willingness to get out there, 
what happens is not about the typical odds. It's not about the numbers. It's about something much deeper and much richer. Mm. And I promise you that that is really true. I've seen it so many times, and I've seen it in my own life. Because when I was at my most gloriously buff and in shape and young, I found nobody. And I was a lot older and a lot less in shape when I met the love of my life, my husband, my partner of 13 years now, uh, because it wasn't about those things that we're told that it's about. So that's what I want to say, kind of a message of hope, because I think there's reason to be hopeful. And also, the degree to which you do this work now is the degree to which you are going to be up-leveling the kind of person you will meet Mm -hmm. when you finally do meet them. So that's also really important. Oh, Ken, thank you so much for sharing that. And then here's the last easy question. And because this is nominally simplifies a a podcast about books and authors who write them. Have you read anything lately that you've loved and you'd recommend? I I think that Harville Hendrick's work changed my life. You know, he created a paradigm where it, it was a completely new archetype of understanding. And his work, Getting the Love You Want, as well as his work now around safe conversations, is life-changing because it teaches us to do deep listening. Mm. And deep listening is hard, but it's world-changing. And the key there, the secret there, like at the essence and the heart of it, is that our deepest healing comes when someone sees behind what we're saying Mm. to who we are. And his work really teaches us how to do that. Oh, that's so nice. What a great way to put it. Mm. Ken Page, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's really just been such a delight and an honor. And I'm so thankful to you. Welcome to the bookend, where we end with books about dating and love and, I guess, all the stuff related to our entire lives. That was an amazing (laughs) conversation. You were like, let's talk about dating. And I was like, let's talk about everything. Everything, indeed. Uh, So Ken Page, world's favorite human. Maybe not true, but I really like Ken Page. I loved that conversation. Um, Yeah, I hope that listeners found it useful. Because I did. Did you find anything useful or interesting there, Ben? I'm kind of curious as to what you think about all this stuff. I think for me, what definitely like gave me that gut punch feeling of like, oh, connecting to this. I've done this before was the wave of distancing Mm -hmm. and this self-protection. Yeah. Maybe a little bit of emotional distance. Yeah. You know what I mean? (laughs) I do. (laughs) Um, (laughs) These these ways that we flee intimacy, like, um, you know working too much. Or for me, a big one is just deflecting and making something funny when really I was trying to be serious and it feels too real to be, to be honest about it. So then I just say something silly and that's a way of avoiding intimacy sometimes. Yeah. What does he say? He says, it's anything that takes us out of the authentic experience of the moment, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a million of them. Everyone has this tick. Some people, I think I've done this also, do a thing where they just name the emotion in the moment and thereby ruin it instead of being in that moment and seeing what happens to be like, just blurt out something that will cut through it and uh, deflate the intimacy. Mm. Yeah. To like diffuse the tension, diffuse whatever was happening. It's really hard to not be the narrator, to just be the the person who's present. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's true. That just, yeah. So um, let's get into the books. I mean, there's so many books about dating and intimacy and love. We've had some amazing simplify episodes about this topic. Mm-hmm. All research is me, search. <laughs> it, it is one of your sweet spots. It is. I think that the most Im- important thing in the world is, you know, loving and being loved and, and loving the people around you in ways that can help you all grow and be better. And uh, I think it's worth researching and worth caring deeply about. I think relationships are work. And I like work. But they're work. Yeah. So you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Um, I want you to go first. All right, I'll pick an easy one. The Five Love Languages Mm -hmm. is a classic. Classic. Yeah, and since then it's become kind of an empire. I think there's like the 
love languages of parenting and love languages for work and uh, I don't know yeah. love languages for mini golf. Uh, <laughs> the five love languages is a classic sort of framework that says you know we all express our love languages different. Some people express it physically and say you know this is how I'm showing my love is that I want to be I want to touch. You know, and some people say, hey, I bought you expensive jewelry. I bought you all this stuff. That's me saying, like, how can you say I'm being distant? Like, this is me showing love. You know, and some people are like, like, look at all this time we have together that I've that mm. I've created out of my schedule. That's me showing, you know, and there's, there's all sorts of uh, different ways to look at it. And it's a practice that often comes up in couples therapy, <clears throat> I've heard, to... <laughs> <laughs> I might also have heard this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to practice being able to communicate with your partner. Mm. what your love language is, uh, and then try and find that space, you know? Yeah. And that's the the really important thing there, I think, is that like you're the way you like to express love may be really different from how your partner likes to receive love. And then you have to figure out, okay, well, what is theirs and how, what kind of compromises can I make in order to enact that? Like, I don't want to buy diamond bracelets, but if that's the way to get through. <laughs> right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> there goes my paycheck for the next 16 years. Um, what's your love language? Do you know? Uh, eggs, like uh, oh. scrambled eggs and omelets and uh, melty cheese in the eggs and spinach. and uh, um, I'm hearing acts of service here. <laughs> acts of service. Huh? Yeah. And like recognition, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mine is definitely quality time. That's my love language for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah, important. Seriously. I, that's how I care about myself is to build in time for uh, myself. Mm-hmm. You're really good at that too. I admire that. Thanks, Caitlin. What book do you want to talk about? Uh, Attached, the new science of adult attachment and how it can help you find and keep love. All right. This, Walk me through uh, yeah, it. This is, this is just a classic of attachment theory, which, I mean, I'm 100% sure we've talked about on the show before. But, um, you know, there's, there's secure attachment, there is anxious attachment, there is uh, avoidant attachment. And your attachment style is, there's actually another one too, which is often referred to as disorganized, which I find kind of disrespectful. But we all kind of fall into generally one of these camps because of the way we were raised, because of, you know, things that we thought we understood about the world when we were kids. And it sort of defines how you're able to interact in a romantic relationship. This is a really easy to enjoy, understand primer on attachment science. And it's super useful. I would say definitely go check it out if you don't know much about attachment science. I only know about attachment science when it comes to kids and parenting. I actually don't know this book. Oh, it's really good. Seriously. Okay. Do you have another book? I mean, you have so many about this topic. It must be hard to just pick two. Yeah. So one of the the books that Ken mentions a lot, which you heard, was Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks. Um, Harville and his partner were the originators of imago therapy, which is a really important kind of couples therapy. But it's uh, the ideas that Harville Hendricks introduces are really foundational to a lot of different kinds of couples therapy and ways of thinking about relationship. Yeah. Getting the love you want. That's a good book. Okay. That was by Harville Hendricks. Yeah. You're right. He mentioned that a lot in the interview. He did. I wish we could do this episode for longer because you have so much to say about it. And I'm lucky because I have your phone number and I get to, you you know, we can write each other <laughs> about this stuff. But so many people out there don't get access to the great Caitlin Schiller encyclopedia of like <laughs> love and dating and intimacy advice. Right. I just want you to know that having encyclopedic information doesn't mean that you'll be successful. <laughs> it's good for your friends, you know? Yeah, exactly. But maybe people can reach out to you if they have stuff. I think it'd be cool if uh, Simplified listeners, if they have questions on this topic... I mean, or anything we talk about, then, you know, reach out to her at Caitlin Schiller on Twitter or email us at podcast at Blinkist.com. <clears throat> I'm not just plugging. I'm serious. Like, I think it'd be fun to, f- I would love to see you uh, uh, be asked the questions. Agreed. I, I've always kind of wanted to have an advice column. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, so Simplify was produced by me, Caitlin Schiller, Ben Schumann Stoller, and Marta Medvedsik. And before we go, if you like this episode, just share it with someone you love. Share it with someone you really love. Share it with, uh, yeah, this is a a great episode to share with someone you love. I'll just keep saying someone you love over and over again. Or if someone you're not sure if you're in love with. I think that's that's what I'm going to share it with. Could also do that and be like, hey, I think I'm I'm experiencing a wave of distancing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So... Yeah, tell us what you think of Simplify. Comment. We love that on Apple Podcasts. Right. And this episode, like Simplify, is brought to you by Blinkist, where Caitlin and I work. Blinkist is an app on iOS, Android, and the web. And we take the key insights from the world's best nonfiction books and podcasts and distill them into about 10 to 15-minute bits that you can listen to. 
the podcasts that we do are called shortcasts and they're new. So check them out in the app if you haven't. What's the voucher code this week, Caitlin? The voucher code is Core Gifts, all one word, C O R E G I F T S. And that'll give you 14 days free to tool around with Blinkist. Yeah, you have to go to blinkist.com slash simplify and there's a try blinkist on the upper right we're really excited about that because we added that to the web page that feels very special <laughs> all right then i guess uh i guess that's it for today yeah like i said caitlin is caitlin schiller on twitter and i'm at Bisto. if you want to ask her a relationship question that's less public email us at podcast at blinkist.com but there are also dms all right right caitlin that'd be cool all right checking out checking out 